Welcome to Shovelware Diggers. Our dig team's currently excavating the Soft Key Shareware 2000 Hit Games 2CD Collection. You can find a link in the video description containing the entire directory structure of this archive. Here's what our diggers have for week 191. For more information on how to join the dig team, simply follow the Patreon link in the video description. Now without further ado, let's get started. First up, we have a team dig from Felicia Gladson and Michael Madsen. Win games backslash arcade2 backslash lotto. Even though this is in the arcade2 folder, I got a funny feeling this is not going to be like an arcade game or something. Although we got a bunch of executables. Um, well, it's got a help file and a write file. So, I'll just let it to read me first. Lotto Simulator from Southwest Software Associates. Copyright 93. Distributed shareware, registration fee of $10, and needs to be made payable to a Don Fordham. Okay then. Lotto Simulator is a combination analysis and simulation tool for PIC6 type lottos. It can be configured for either PIC650 or PIC649 type lottos. That's kind of limiting, wouldn't if you're gonna have like that level of customization, wouldn't you make it better than that? I don't know. Lotto Simulator can be used to maintain an unlimited number of databases consisting of actual lottery results. It comes with a sample database of all Texas lotto drawings from inception to the release date of the program. It can be simulate the results of up to 8,000 lotto drawings. Interesting. Okay, something I find funny right away is right here in the README, it says many people feel their chances are improved by being able to track biases and number frequency or statistical anomalies resulting in numbers becoming overdue or hot. If you believe in either of these theories, Lotto Simulator will do the calculations for you. So the way this has been worded, even the author of the program is very much aware of the fact that probability is not something you can predict. <laughs> like you can use the program to, you can use the program to see these statistical averages and everything, but that's ultimately not going to make a difference. Okay, so we gotta figure out what executable we actually have to run here. Um. I'm gonna guess probably the Lotto Sim file. So I don't think it would be the installer. Okay, there we go. Lotto Simulator version 1.1. Okay. So what do we do here? Also, I find it interesting, not only are we maximized, but we don't even get minimize or restore buttons. <laughs> so this program actually has a problem with you. What? <laughs> what? Okay. I was about to say this program apparently has a problem with you, like, getting rid of it or something, but you can move it. So it's not actually maximized. The person just wrote it so that it would check the size of the desktop and create a window that fit in that desktop without actually being a maximized window. And then removed the maximize and minimize buttons. Because that makes sense. Anywho. Um, so can we actually open anything? Okay, so the Texas historical lottery data. And this goes back for how many drawings? Uh, not that many. It only goes back for 86 drawings. Hmm. You'd think there'd be a bit more data to it, but whatever. So... I guess what we can do here is, like, check some of this stuff here. So... See, options. Pick numbers. I guess I can pick our numbers of, I don't know, 5, uh, 12, 23, 31, 32, and 40. Oh, one second. Get it in. There we go. 40. So there's our numbers. And let's see. So show my results on analysis. So with these numbers, out of the 87 drawings that are in the database, we hit one number 35 times, which is probably worth nothing. We hit two numbers 19 times, which in a six number lottery might be worth something. 
but there's a chance it might not be. And then we only hit three numbers once, which kind of makes sense. Um, we got a number frequency graph here. So out of the 87 drawings in the database, it looks like... Um, how do I actually read this? Okay, so these are the numbers across the bottom. So zero is obviously not a number. I don't know. <laughs> like, that's what's confusing me there. But um, so two, six, 12, 19. Two, six, 12, and 19 are the numbers that seem to show up the least. And then apparently lucky number 10 is the one that's shown up 16 times out of those 87 drawings. Now this is showing the hottest numbers, which is probably like the most likely ones. As we already established, 10 is pretty, pretty hot. And then overdue numbers, so the ones that have shown up the least. So I should put, I should mention that I have actually written a program like this myself. And I was doing it to, I was doing it to investigate one of the lotteries in my neck of the woods. And I actually went a step further than what this program is doing and I actually made like a grid that compared how often each number showed up with each other number and it was sort of like a colored grid where the hot where the colors would sort of brighten and go from like a dark color to a brighter to a brighter more vibrant color to sort of indicate which numbers paired up which which with which numbers the most and I put a lot of data into that program. I put like 10 years worth of data <laughs> into that program and test. And once, once I had it all in there, like I tested it out, I tested it out. Like I ran, like I picked different numbers that the program was recommending and then ran them through to see if how they would work based on the historical data and yeah, 99% of the time it came back as never doing anything good. So yeah, when it comes to this kind of stuff, you can run all the statistical analyses you want, but when it comes down to it, every time they do a lottery drawing, every single number has an equal chance of being selected. It doesn't matter what the historical data is. This is something that comes up whenever they're doing any kind of odds with like poker games or stuff. You have two different kinds of odds that you can be calculating. You can be calculating the, you can be calculating the cumulative odds. So the odds of something happening given a zero state where nothing's been done yet. Or you can calculate the current odds, the odds of what's going to happen regardless of everything that's happened up to that point, because the Whatever the status of the current situation is, the current odds don't change based on the past, unless there's something about the past that affects how those odds are going to be going to play out. Like if a particular card is missing from a deck or something. But cumulative odds is when you're in that state where you haven't done any of your any of your calculations yet, and it's like, what's the odds that this, something is going to happen X number of times? To put it to put it simply, cumulative odds is like what are the odds of flipping a coin and getting heads three times in a row? Well, the odds are one in eight because it's a one in two for the first heads. It's one in four to get two heads and one in eight to get three heads. But if you get your first head, what's the odds that you're going to get another head? Well, it's still one in two. And if you get that head, what's the odds you're going to get a third head? Well, it's one in two. And those are the current odds because you're calculating based on the one action you're about to perform, regardless of everything that's happened up to that point. <laughs> so that's why programs like this lotto simulator here, they're interesting. They're interesting in the um, way they disseminate the data, but they're ultimately useless. Next up, the Great Code Holio has dug up DOS games backslash arcade backslash Adams VGA. Well, probably something nuclear at this rate. Um, Adams, Adams VGA, an SCR file, so <laughs> are we going back into Windows? Or no, wait, this is an EGA VGA VGI, so it's got to be not Windows, so that's probably like a fixed screen or something. It's also a batch file. Um, 
I don't see anything that would actually be like text, like maybe the help file, but I got my doubts. Well, let's just see what happens. Edit in Adams VGA dot H L P. Yeah, that's not a text file. Um, <laughs> well, the, all the batch file does is run the executable. So whatever, Adams VGA. This game was made by Interes. Prague, Czechoslovakia. Okay, so we've got a Czech game here. Exploding Atoms. And after a bunch of sparkles, we see that the author is Pavel Pola. Uh, effects by the same person, and also an M. Basta. Okay. And suddenly we're not VGA anymore, we're text mode. Okay. Well, I guess this is just how it's going to be configured or something. So, information. So, apparently this was written in Turbo Pascal 6. That explains the BGI files. Um, what's the help say? Because, like, I mean, right now we're using um, a sort of user, a sort of GUI that Borland basically included so that people could easily do this kind of stuff. So it's just basically using the, the built-in Borland GUI for this. Um, so I guess we'll just say using mouse in the game. So moving, just move the mouse, put Adam with left mouse button and return to menu with right mouse button. Okay. So what's actually the, like how do we actually play the game? <laughs> well, still looking to see how to play the game, but it looks like the uh, Don Adams in the USA was handling the registrations outside of Czechoslovakia and apparently the registration fee or a sort of gift actually is ten dollars or any amount okay so it's actually not in the um the system menu it was actually in the game rules section here so rules of the game exploding atoms this game is played on chessboard with 8x8 fields. Each of these fields is a value. The value is equal to the number of neighboring fields in horizontal and vertical direction. Okay. Oh. Oh. We played a game like this, didn't we? Where the whole idea is that you're trying to add a whole bunch of atoms into a particular space, then once it exceeds a certain value, it ex like explodes outwards to neighboring spaces. So yeah, the aim of the game is to reach the state where the atoms of only one color are on the chessboard. It doesn't pertain to the first move. The game is played by two players. One of them can be replaced by the computer, which is good because we're going to need that. <laughs> um, first player has red atoms. Second player has blue atoms. The player with the red atoms starts the game. Player takes turns moving. The player whose turn it is puts one atom on the field of the chessboard. This field can't be occupied by atoms of another color field can be empty or with your atoms. If the number of atoms on one field of the chessboard is equal to the value of this field, an explosion takes place. An explosion is an action in which the atoms from the given field are dispersed to the neighboring fields, and the exploding field will be empty. Okay then. Okay, so explosions will actually recolor all the atoms to your own color. So I guess that kind of makes sense. Okay, so we'll set one player, and here's our board. Okay, so now what? <laughs> I guess we're playing red player, so if we put it, made a move like here. Okay. Um, here. Because I mean, there can only be two in a corner, right? So if we go like that. Oh, it won't, won't actually let me put one here for some reason. So I guess we're only allowed to put atoms into spaces where that are empty or have our own color on it. Okay, I see what's kind of what's going on here. Yeah. So yeah, it seems like the trick is to try and get try and get chain reactions to take place, but that means also understanding like when a chain reaction is going to take place. Like, if I put an atom here, and he puts one here, it's going to just start chain reacting like crazy. So yeah, he could put one here, and then it would end up putting one in all of these spots. But, one trick that he's in here is that he doesn't want to 
increase these spots to three because then I could chain react to one of them. So I'm kind of keeping that in mind here. So yeah, so if I go like this now, interesting. So yeah, so through some clever placements, I've been able to sort of take over this area of the board. Of course, now that we both have pieces on the board, the goal is to eradicate the opponent from the board. So like he's about to chain react this stuff. So I don't want to give him too, too easy of a time of that. See, so yeah, and he's about to do it again. So, like, I mean, if he does it here, it's going to chain react to these four, four spaces. But none of them are a triple, so I don't have to worry about it, you know, exploding outwards even further. So I'm going to put one here. So that way, what I can do is I can go like this. And there you go. So I think what I would want to do is just sort of prepare myself for one... He does the chain reaction, or find some way to prevent it, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, it's almost like a bit of a standoff, the condition this is in right now. So if I go to something like this, and then do this, oh yeah, that had, a f that had an effect. <laughs> and then we're going to go like this. Ooh, I was hoping for a... Oh, that wasn't good. That wasn't good. <laughs> that was very not good. <laughs> um. Oh, there I go. And I lost. So yeah, that was Exploding Atoms. Um, we've seen a game like this before, and this one plays in a pretty similar way. Um. It's kind of interesting how it uses the Turbo Pascal, or the, just the Borland graphical user interface before you actually get into the game itself. But other than that, the game itself plays perfectly fine. And our last dig for today from RuneFox is wingames backslash gg backslash uchur. Well, it looks like we've got another uchur game, which is one of those card games I have no idea how to play. <laughs> So this could go well. Uh, Readme.txt. Files in this archive, installation, simple as placing all three and above in a directory, created for Windows 3.1. Oh, and this is actually a freeware program from the looks of it. And the person has an email address. <laughs> you do not see many email addresses from software this old. Well, let's run it. So, user program information. This version of user is freeware. Okay, and um, okay, well, does it maximize? Uh, kind of. <laughs> so, the outer bars maximized fine, but the inner play field didn't. So, we'll just leave it as this. Okay, so instructions. Um, rules of future. Future is played by two teams, two players. Teammates sit opposite from each other around the table. Object objective of future is to be the first team to score 10 points by winning tricks in each of a number of hands. Okay, so rank of the cards in future is as follows. Right bower? Is the jack of trump? If spades were trump, the jack of spades would be the right bower. I already am confused. So it seems as, do, as though some kind of suit is going to be like a Trump suit or something. And then that sort of determines like which cards are going to be valued at which level. That's kind of weird. Yeah, looking through these rules, I understand why I've never tried playing Uchur because I am having trouble wrapping my head around these rules. So... You, you remember, you remember anyone see the original series Star Trek where you got that one episode and Kirk is trying to get out of this bad situation by inventing this game called Fizzbin? <laughs> yeah, I kind of feel like, I kind of feel like the rules are like Fizzbin. <laughs>
because I'm having trouble just following them. And I think maybe that was like part of the joke is that it can be really tricky to follow the rules on some of these old card games. And yeah, so I guess in this case, it set, it set it up so that player four is a human player. Um, well, that's not fun. You can't set the card back visually. You have to do it from a menu. Um, does the about screen say anything special? Not really. Okay, so I guess new game. Um, continue? Okay. So, I guess I have the option to either pick up this card, go alone, or pass. Um, I guess I'll pass. So, player two is going to pick it up. Um, because, yeah, I'm not sure what I'm trying to do here. I think I just put the nine of, or how do I? It had it wanted me to click the continue button. Um, I guess maybe now I choose a card. Okay, so player two wins that. He's got a jack of spades, and the spade is the trump card, so I think that actually means that that jack right there is, like, more valuable than anything, so I think I'm just going to get rid of a nine. Okay, so why does he win with a king of diamonds when I've got a king of hearts? I don't get that. Um, so if I put down an ace of clubs, okay, so I do win that because that's a trump symbol suit. Um... Start putting down an ace of hearts. Okay. Uh, let's do queen of clubs. Okay, the jack is apparently better if it's the same the same suit there. So that's why player three won there. Okay, so he won that even with the lowest ranked card because it was a club. Yeah, I, I don't understand the rules, but I do like the fact, even though I don't know, have any idea what I'm doing here, I do like the fact that I can actually play this game without understanding the rules. So the game is actually making, is actually making a decent effort to make the game approachable. I have to follow suit. I guess because everybody else did. Okay, so why does he win with a jack of clubs when the spade... Ugh. You know what? <laughs> I'm done with this. I don't get the rules of future. I don't... You don't ex try to explain it to me in the comments. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to get it there either. I'm just going to say that this seems to work perfectly fine as a program, and just leave it at that.